All right, 2 Kings chapter 4, please. 2 Kings 4. <clears throat> The story is about the great woman of Shunem. She sees Elisha passing by here quite often. So she wants to minister to the minister. It's kind of like how you've done to this minister. Thank you so much. The great woman of Shunem wanted to be a blessing to the minister. Wanted to encourage, wanted to nourish, wanted to provide whatever need that he had so that he can keep laboring for the Lord. Elisha, who took over the ministry of Elijah, was so impressed with this great woman of Shunem that he asked his servant Gehazi what was it that she would probably want. The great woman of Shunem never told him what she wanted because all she thought about was ministering to the minister kind of like all of you. So Gehazi was able to tell Elisha, I know that she doesn't have a child. So Elisha blessed her with a child, and she had the pride and joy of her life until the child died. When we look at 2 Kings chapter 4, the Bible points out at verse 8, and it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he, call, and, and he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season, that Elisha had said unto her, According to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. As soon as the great woman of Shunem was blessed with a child, you can imagine that she was thinking, man, I'm sure glad that I took care of that man of God, that prophet Elisha, because of what I've done for the Lord, ministering to his church, so to speak, to his preacher, so to speak, trying to do what I can in my part. I don't have much, but I've done whatever I could to just be a blessing to this preacher. And look what God did with my life. I've been blessed with a child. Lord, you've been so good to me. The blessings that you blessed me with, I can't even count them. All because of serving God, the great I am that I am. And it is worth it, friend. You can imagine that great woman of Shunem telling others, it is worth it when you serve God. There's nothing out there in the world. Pay attention to God's ministry. Pay attention to God's preacher and the people in need. Minister as best as you can, and God will bless your life. Look at me. I am living proof of that. You know my case, that I was hopeless, that a lot of people looked down on me. They said that it was impossible for me to have a child because my husband is old, yet look what God did, a miracle in my life. And you can imagine that other people around her, maybe some of them were unbelievers, that they saw the miracle that God did upon her life, and they said, you know what, you're right, wow, I don't know what you got, but man, I think that maybe God is real. Maybe what you say is true. You know that church that you kept talking about? I might go along in, to church with you. Okay, what time is the church open? I think God is real. And you can imagine that great woman of Shunem is rejoicing God as long as she had her child. Her child was evidence and witness of God's blessing. To 
throughout that whole time, isn't it interesting that Elisha was not present? I could assume that way, and I might be wrong, but I assume that way because when you look down at that verse, in verse 26, Elisha tells Gehazi to ask the great woman of Shunem, how is your child doing? Is he doing well? Meaning that he hasn't, he hasn't come often to the great woman of Shunem's place anymore. Back then, Elisha would visit often. Back then, the great woman of Shunem would pay attention to Elisha, minister to Elisha's need. Elisha was her very own focus in her life before the child was born. But after the child was born, you notice Elisha is not the focal point anymore. You know, it's interesting that Elisha is a great typology of Jesus Christ. And his name means, my God is my salvation. God is my salvation. There was no doubt that Elisha came upon her life. God was her salvation. Changed her whole life, and that was the only focus that she ever had until God blessed her with a child. And with God's blessing that she received, she soon forgot the one who gave the blessing to her. And the child, as soon as the child was born and was grown up, it's interesting that the Word of God says, and when the child was grown. Can you imagine during that whole time when the child was grown? Elisha was not the focal point. Elisha was not the one she spent all of her time on. It was the child. When the child was grown, she perhaps did minister to Elisha, don't get me wrong, but it was not as much as before. She didn't give to God's ministry. She didn't help out God's ministry as much as she did before. Once she got blessed by the Lord, it started to fade a little bit, right? Start to slow down a bit. Don't get me wrong, she gave God the glory. The child was a miracle. She probably used her child as a good testimony for other people around her. And don't get me wrong, she never skipped church. She never skipped her Bible reading and her prayer. And she did help out God's ministry. And I'm sure that she helped out Elisha here and there. But great woman of Shunem, it was not the same as before, was it? Before God blessed you with the child. Before God answered your prayer, before God did something miraculous in your life, it wasn't the same as before that you worked as hard in the ministry back then. It wasn't like before when Jesus Christ was your all in all. What happened? You had a fire, you had a desire, and all you thought about was ministering to Elisha. God is my salvation. He was your all in all, and then you got a job, didn't you, great woman of Shunem? God blessed you with your job, and now that job, your child, is your focal point, not the one who gave you the job. Then you got married, right? Praise the Lord, God blessed you with marriage. But it's not like the same as before, right? You didn't shout as much as before. Your track passing wasn't as much as before. Your service to God and Getting involved in church wasn't as much as before. Then God blessed you with a child, right? And I mean literally a child. God blessed you with a child, and now you're raising a family, and man, it was a miracle in your life, and you're like, thank you, God. Oh, thank you, Lord. And then you brought the child to church. Everybody was happy, and you gave that baby perhaps as a dedication to God, and that was a blessed thing in your life. But now, while the child is growing up, what happened to Jesus? You're not raising that child in the admonition of the Lord. You're skipping out on church, and then the child has grown up into skipping church. The child is seeing some of those same old things that you didn't get right with God, and that child's influenced by that. What happened back then? Because God blessed you in your life, and now Elisha is out of the picture. You weren't reading the Bible as much as before. You weren't praying as much as before. 
Your shout has diminished and you aren't shouting as much as before. No one's running around anymore. No one's showing up for street preaching visitation. Why? Because God blessed you with the church building. Because God blessed you with freedom finally in California to witness the gospel. And it just... God has blessed you with the child and the child has grown up. Grown up to a point that he blocked and distanced between you and your Elisha. The God who is your salvation. Father God, will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood? I pray that today's preaching will change our lives. Lord, you've been so good to us. Lord, you blessed us. Now convict us. We can get lost in the blessing and forget our service to you. Will you convict us and change us? God forbid that this church will be blessed too much that we lose our service for you. And Lord, I've just been blessed by these people today. What a blessing. And the most dishonest, the most ungrateful thing I can ever do to these people is to not work twice as hard. Lord, the same thing with us. It would be the most dishonest, the most ungrateful thing that this church can ever do is that you blessed us and we don't serve you twice as hard. So fill within me, Father. Make the preach and reach them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Bible says at verse 18, and when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to a lad, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. <laughs> Do you see that there? The child was grown up. His head was hurting. And then what did the mother do? The mother just put him on the bed of what? Elisha. And shut the door behind her. Now that's a strange thing to do. Can you imagine that little boy who's working outside in the field with his father? And every single day is God's blessing that the great woman of Shunem is seeing. Every single day, all she's seeing is God's blessing. That child working hard in the field, growing bigger, taller, stronger, and about to carry on the family name, the family job, and she just filled in the void in her life. And that little child, that of her pride and joy, her love, and only a mother can understand that, means so much to her. And then all of a sudden, can you imagine the thing that you prize the most, one you love the most, saying, my head, my head. And he's groaning in pain, and he's crying, and he's breathing hard. And you can't imagine your own baby boy going through something like that. Your little child, the one who means so much to you. And that baby boy is being laid upon the mother's lap. And can you picture that great woman of Shunem trying to do all that she can to help her child breathe a little better and make him more comfortable but all he's doing is sweating and all he's crying out, that verse says, my head, my head. And she can't do anything. She pulled up every kind of medicine, every kind of treatment. She called in the doctors. She tried to soothe him, comfort him, but no, the child was dying and his face was turning paler and paler and paler she did whatever she could to protect her blessing it meant so much to her and during that whole time she never contacted Elisha she never contacted Elisha that whole time she did it her own way she tried to comfort and protect the blessing that she had as best as she could because that child means so much to her she can't leave the child. Can you break a mother from her child that's dying? No. She couldn't let go of the child. It meant so much to her. So she did not contact Elisha all that time until the child finally died. When the child finally died, what did she do? Now Elisha dawned on her mind. 
Now she remembered Elisha. She remembered the promise that Elisha had given to her, and she decided, I'm going to cling on to that promise. I'm going to hold him to his word. And what she did, I mean the strange act, she took up that dead child, laid him upon the bed of Elisha. That same room that she built for Elisha, that same bed that she built for Elisha, the room and the bed that Elisha slept on was able to rest in, she surrendered her child on the bed of Elisha and shut the door behind her. She separated herself from her child. She shut the door behind her and gave her child up to whatever remained of Elisha. Is Elisha the thing that you're seeking after and realize is the solution? And isn't Elisha the one that you put off all that time, brother and sister in Christ? Elisha means God is my salvation. But all that time, you couldn't, right? Because you had your child. That child didn't mean to, but that's what happens with God's blessing on your life, whatever that blessing is. It's your job. It's this church building. It's the money. It's the family. It's good people in this church and a good pastor. And then what happened is th that child of yours, what God blessed your life, started to grow up and put a gap and a wedge between you and Elisha. Between you and your Savior. Between you and your God is my salvation. And then that child was dying, right? Because the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And then you are going like, my head, my head. And you're the one raising up your hands in Wednesday night Bible study. Please pray for me. I'm going through a trial, a hard moment. And when you go back home after church, it's not like you've been refreshed. It's more like when you go back home, it's my head. My head, because the trial is so hard to bear. Because the burden is too great to carry. God, why did you do this upon my life? Why are you afflicting my blessing? Why are you afflicting my child? Why are you taking him away? And here you are, you're doing all you can to protect your child. And you're sweating it out, and you're grieving, and you're doing the best you can to pillow your child, to make it as comfortable as possible for your child. Because the suffering's too great, the afflictions too great, and you're going, my head, my head. And during all that time, you still did not contact Elisha. You still didn't surrender the child to Elisha. You would not give up the child to Elisha until the child died. Until God permanently puts you at a point where you got nothing else to turn to. You can't protect your child anymore because the child's gone. And what you've finally done is, with some of you, you didn't get it through your thick skulls yet. Here you are just, because you can't break a mother's love for that child, right? You can't break the tie that binds a person and his or her blessing. It means that much to you, don't it? And it's hard to break it. I don't blame you for that. Can any mother separate from her sick, dying child? No. But I'm telling you the truth. You need to let the child go. Put the child on the bed of Elisha and shut the door behind you and finally say, Lord, he's yours. And you need to finally say, Lord, that blessing is yours, not mine. Lord, the focus is on you. I'm so sorry. I, I put you on a shelf. I've just been blessed too much because I think that I'm a real Bible believer, that we got a building and we got all these programs of so
so many souls getting saved all the time that I did not stop to think that I was so concentrated on the blessing rather than my part for you. I did not put you in the picture. And that's why, Lord, my fire for you has been dying. My labor for you has been dying because I've been more obsessed with your blessing than you. And that whole time, what are you doing? You know what a lot of you are doing? You're not surrendering the child to Elisha. You still want to cling on to your child, can you? But I'll tell you one thing. You're still going to hold on to your head then and keep going, my head, my head, my head. Why? Because no man can serve two masters. He will hate the one or love the other. When you live in that conflict, you cannot help but your heart be troubled, your emotions worried, and your mind in two places because you got to make up your mind and say, it's Jesus Christ, not this thing, not this job, not this possession, not this family member, not a loving relationship, not even my church, but Jesus Christ. And you'll never gain peace until you surrender that child to God. pitiful and sad, don't you think so? You're clinging on to your child. <laughs> the child screaming out, my head, my head, and you're just wasting your time, do you understand? Trying to keep that child breathing, trying to protect that child with all you've got. You're just wasting time, precious time. It's so pitiful and sad. Why don't you just finally let it go and shut the door behind you. Put the child on the bed of God and put that child on the altar of God and say, God, he's yours. And you finally get peace. When you keep reading down over here, the Bible says, in verse 22, And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. Oh, you see that there? She's, when she's seeking after Elisha, she don't get it that easy. She's not going to get it that easy. I mean, if she kept ministering as faithfully as she could to Elisha, perhaps Elisha would have been nearby or in her home by now, and she could have gotten Elisha easy, and Elisha could have been there to heal her boy. But no, time has passed because the child was growing, because the child was the focus, not Elisha. Elisha has been distanced from the great woman of Shunem's life, and Elisha now is far away. And now that she surrendered the child on the bed of Elisha, she knew this, I'm not going to get Elisha as easily as before. I'm not going to get him as easily as before because time has passed and now he's a distance away. So I'm going to have to do whatever I can, work as hard as I can to get Elisha back. And you know what she told her servant? She said, we're going to get saddle us a ride and saddle us some donkeys and we're going to find Elisha. And by the way, servant, when you go on ahead of me, to find Elisha, don't you dare slow down for me. Don't slack. Even if I'm panting, even if I'm in danger, even if I'm very tired, I'm not going to let any excuse in this world stop me from getting to Elisha. Amen. Now, when you are seeking after Elisha finally, to take care of your problem, it ain't easy, is it? It ain't easy. You know, you got to read the Bible and pray so that you can get God, my salvation. God is my salvation to save your life, to minister to you. 
but it ain't as easy as before now, right? Because your Bible reading and prayer life slow down as long as you had that child, as long as God blessed your life. And you've been backsliding, you've been slowing down your Bible reading and prayer, and now it's hard to get back to your God. He ain't as near as to you as before when you used to read the Bible and pray much more before God blessed you with the child. And now you have to work extra hard. And here you are. You know what you got to do? You got to tell yourself, I can't slack off. And guess what? Don't you dare slow down. Don't you dare stop. I don't care if I'm in danger. I don't care if I'm tired. I don't care if I'm stressed out. I don't care if I'm discouraged. I'm not going to let any excuse in the world slow me down to get my God back to me. And so you read through your Bible. You pray like there's no tomorrow. Now coming to church is not as easy as before now, right? Okay. Because God blessed you. And when he blessed your life, your church attendance slowed down. And now when you want your God back and you know you got to get back to church, it ain't as easy as before. A oh man, you got to tell yourself, I can't slow down. I don't care if my health is bad, and I don't care if I got these problems at work, and I don't care if I got these excuses and that excuse. Nothing can slow me down to get back to my God, and I'll do whatever I can. I don't care if there's traffic. I don't care if I'm tired. I don't, have to, I don't care if I have to pull all-nighters. I don't care if I'm discouraged and weighed down. Don't you dare slow down for me. I'm going to run to my God and you drive hours to this church if you have to. Wow. Amen, brother. Slack not thy writing for me. Good. Now, does this mean that uh, we should be judgmental of people if they're not seeking after God hard enough? Do we blame people if they don't come out to witnessing as much as before, participate much in church as before? No, you'll notice right here what the Bible says. In verse 24, except I bid thee. See that? Verse 24, slack not thy writing for me, except I bid thee. What does that mean? That means God is reasonable. He understands you have an excuse. He understands that there are some things you have to slow down a bit. God's not a taskmaster. But do you think, I have a question for you. Do you think at verse 24, the great one, woman of Shunem, she focused more on except I bid thee more than slack not thy riding for me. Which one do you think she focused more on? I'll tell you what you're focusing more on. Except I bid thee slack your riding. Except I bid thee slack your riding. Lord, this is too much. Please slow it down. I'm bidding you. I'm bidding you. What happened to, no way, I'm going, no way, don't you dare slow down, no way, I want my Jesus Christ, I want Elisha, God is my salvation, don't you dare soldier on, press on, I'm going to die on the battlefield. What happened to that? What happened to that? Well, it's hard, preacher. It wouldn't be as hard if you kept ministering to Elisha daily like you did before. If you minister, that's your fault. If you minister to Elisha as much as you did before, Bible reading wouldn't be that tough and prayer wouldn't be that tough and getting back into soul winning would not be tough and passing out tracts to people would not be tough and getting to church would not be as tough. But see, your child grew. God blessed you too much. It grew. And it put a wedge between you and your service for God. So then there's been a gap now with your church attendance, soul winning, reading the Bible, praying, and other stuff you've been doing for the Lord. So when you get back to that, of course it'll be tough. And that's on you. Do trials happen? Are we judgmental of people? Absolutely not. I dare not do that. But I'm telling you in reality... When I went through trial, when I went through pain, I knew if I slacked off in that Bible reading and prayer and church, I knew, I knew that when I get back to that, it's going to be a lot harder. So I'm just telling you a matter of fact, not judging you, because I've been through it. 
And I'm sure glad no one judged me when I was going through that. Neither should any of you. But I'm telling you a reality and a matter of fact truth that you better remember, that you better keep in your heart. And I pray to God what's screaming out of your heart today is not, except I bid for thee, slack off a bit. No, it's more so of slack, not thy waiting for me. And when we look at uh, verse 25... So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Hallelujah, behold, yonder is a Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. Oh, hallelujah. You know that Shunammite, she was trying to meet Elisha. God is my salvation. Oh, God, I want you to be my salvation. Oh, God, I want you to save me from this problem. Lord, I've been stuck in this bondage of creation for far too long, and I just want to be with you. I want you to deliver me. And she had to go up to Carmel, and when she went up to Carmel to see her Elisha, God is my salvation, Elisha responded, Behold, is that Shunammite? Let's run to her and find out what's going on and give her a helping hand. Man, you know what that's a typology of? Do you realize that this scenario of the Shunammite going to Mount Carmel to meet up with her salvation, her deliverance in her problem is a typology of Jesus Christ going to see his bride, the church, and rapture them out from this God-forsaken problem. I mean, I want you to look at, uh, keep your hand here and go to Song of Solomon 6. Song of Solomon chapter 6. Now, the majority of Christians, they know about the wife of Solomon, that she was called by this word, by this name. And actually, the wording is the same thing as the Shunammite, even though it's just one letter difference. Shulamite. But it's the same person. And that Shulamite, who is the bride of Solomon, is a picture of the church. And Solomon is a picture of Jesus Christ. Look at Song of Solomon chapter 6 and verse 13. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon thee. What will he see in the Shulamite as it were the company of two armies? That Shulamite is running. And this is an example of the second advent. But within the second advent is also the rapture. If you keep reading down, notice where she's coming from. When you look at chapter 7, verse 5. Chapter 7, verse 5. You know where she's coming from? Thine head upon thee is like caramel. <laughs> and the hair of thine head like purple. The king is held in the galleries. Oh, the king is coming. And when the king sees her, oh, look at this in verse 10. I am my beloved's and his desires toward me. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Come up hither, come, my love. That's what the Shulamite, the Shunammite is calling. See, she's running. She is running to her husband, to the groomsman. She is running to her Solomon, to Jesus Christ. The church is running. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus. And that's all we're looking at is our groomsmen. And man, Jesus is what we're obsessed with, not our child. Jesus is all of our focus, not our children. Jesus is everything that we're focusing on. And in that light, we are running looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, 
Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And here we are. We're running. We're running to our Savior. And we're going, God, my focus is on you. God, Jesus Christ is my everything. Jesus is all the world to me. And I'm running to you. I'm running to you. And God is just looking at your Christian race and see how much you want him that badly. And he's looking at your race and seeing, let's see if that brother and sister, let's see if my child wants me to come. Really wants me to deliver them from the problem. Wants my God, his my salvation. And here God is, and he goes, Gabriel, Gehazi, oh, excuse me, Gabriel, Gabriel, you know, Gehazi's just a type of Gabriel. <laughs> Gabriel, come over here. Hey, Gabriel, behold, yonder is a Shunammite. There's a church. He's running toward me. Let's go down there. And let's run to her. And we'll meet in the clouds of the air. That's our meeting point. And as she runs to me and I run to her, woo, then I will take her up. And we're going to be together. Come away with me, my love. And we'll live happily ever after. Amen, brother. I like this. Yeah, 2 yeah, Kings 4. Ain't it strange? Gehazi asks... Uh, Shunammite at verse 26. Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? Elisha is asking her that question through Gehazi. Is it well? She answered. <laughs> it is well. It's not well. What are you talking about? You're in grief? You're in sorrow? What do you mean by that? Did you notice she said the same thing at verse 23? When she said, I want to see Elisha. And then he said, why? Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, it shall be well. You know what she knew? She knew that. You know what I think? Maybe she's lying. I don't know. She's hiding her pain. I don't know. But I, what I like to think is that because she did the extreme of putting the child on his bed, she knew that Elisha would come for her. She had faith and she believed that no matter how bad her situation was, that Elisha would take care of the problem and he would solve it. Brother and sister in Christ, when our child dies, we might be in grief, but we know in our heart that it will be well Amen. with our soul because God is in control and he'll take care of the problem and he'll take care of the situation. And that's why that songwriter says that when his children died out at sea, he wrote, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Also, <laughs> when she saw Elisha coming, when she saw God is my salvation coming, she said, it is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. And like that songwriter said, Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. The Lord shall be said, even so, it is well, it is well with my soul. When your child dies, do you tell yourself, it is well okay. with my soul? Or do you carry the grief? Or pitiful, more pitiful, you're just trying to keep that child going when he's dying. Do you realize that everything in this world is dying? It's temporary, turns to dust. That's a pitiful life you're doing, just trying to survive every day. I know what it's like in the Bay Area, just trying to survive every day. Yeah. Oh, that's pitiful. Can you not put the child on the bed okay, come on. of your God? who is your salvation, and say, no matter what my lot is, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And God, you're coming. God, you're coming for me. 
What have I to fear? What have I to weep? What have I to worry? It is well with my soul. Amen. That's good. Are you saying that to yourself? It's about time when depression comes to you and says, aren't you feeling sad? Is everything okay? That you respond to depression, it is well okay. with my soul. When fear comes to you and says, man, things are so bad. God is so unfair, isn't he? And bitterness arises. And you hear too many voices around you. And they get on you. Can you say, it is well. It is well with my soul. And can you sing that tune out of your heart? Maybe some tears might flow out of your eyes when you sing it. And with that bitterness, you give it to the Lord and you say, it is well. It is well with my soul. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, when you go to verse 27... And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. <laughs> Elisha didn't know what happened because the Lord hid the problem. Hid the problem. And that is such a grievous scenario. She has so much grief, and the Lord hid it from Elisha. The grief is so great, not because, listen, not because we're not mentally prepared for it. I know that we ought to be mentally prepared. We ought to keep in mind when I say I surrender all, I mean that. I surrender all. And we got to be strong in the Lord, but well, let's be honest. When that trial actually hits, it's not something that you are mentally prepared for. It's something you never thought before. Maybe you thought that it would happen and it did, but the feeling was just different. And the feeling you did not expect to hurt that much. You know why? Trials and sufferings always hit us hard because the Lord hid it from us. Because the Lord never made you feel like this before. The Lord never made you fear like this before. Allowed this suffering to be this hard. The Lord hid it from you. And maybe if we were just mentally prepared, maybe if God showed us a little bit, then perhaps we could be more well grounded in suffering, trial, and pain. But pain hits us so hard because... It's something the Lord hid from us. That's why our soul is in grief. And at that time, you'll notice that in verse 28, <laughs> this sounds like you, right? What you say to God. Then she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Oh, that never happened to you good godly Bible believers. You never said to God, Lord, this is unfair. Lord, you tricked me. Lord, how can you let these unfair things happen to me in my life? Never said that, did it? And the Lord hid that from you, didn't he? So in verse 29, this is how Elisha responds. Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins and take my staff in thine hand and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not, and if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. I want you to heal my child, Elisha. He's dead. And Elisha says, okay, Gehazi, here's a staff. I want you to put on the face of the child, and he'll be healed. You know what the woman could have done? 
Thank you so much. I appreciate that. No, she didn't do that. You know what she did? She said uh, at verse 30, And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. You know what she said? No, 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 that's not what I want. But your child's going to be healed. No, no, that's not what I want. Well, here's a staff. You know, this staff, I got the double portion of God's spirit. Don't you think that's going to heal your child? No, that's not what I want. Well, didn't you hear about the rod of Moses? The rod of Moses could do miracles, and I got twice the power of God's Spirit. And wouldn't that be something if uh, God resurrected your child through a dead piece of stick? No, that's not what I want. She said right here, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. As the Lord liveth, I will not leave thee. Elisha... Oh, man, you let me for a long time, and I remember that, and the child was my focus, and I let it go, but no more. I don't want that anymore. I ran all this way to get you, not Gehazi, not your miracle rod, and not the resurrection of my child. I came for you, Elisha. Now you come down with me. You become a part of my life. That's what I rode all the way for. Now, when you're going through a problem and your child dies, if God answered your prayer and said your child will live, you'll get your blessing back. You know what you and I are going to do? You and I are going to be content and go, okay, thank you, God. Praise the Lord. What a great God. And you know what's going to happen? Back to ground zero. Your focus is on the child again and not on my God. Come on is my salvation. What happened to your running? I thought you said you weren't going to slack off. I thought you said that you're going to run to Elisha. I thought that was the one. Wouldn't you say, after running, looking unto Jesus, and let us run the race with patience, that the finish line would be Jesus Christ? And that's the one you want to see? That's the one that you're going to live your whole life for? Isn't that the person that you want to see? And when God says, no, 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 it's, uh, you don't need me. I mean, I'll give you a good job. I'll give you a good church building. I'll give you good Bible-believing brothers and sisters in Christ. I'll answer your prayer, and I'll save your loved one, and I'll give you this, I'll give you that. I know what you want, and I'll take care of you. Wouldn't you say, no, God forbid, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul live, I will not leave you again. But you leave Jesus Christ. You abandon ship as soon as God gives you your child back. And if you're not careful, the devil's going to use that. And what was your weakness before? The devil will use that weakness and the Lord will hide it from you where you least expect it and you weren't mentally prepared. And the devil will use that to get you out of your Christian race again. If you don't realize who your obsession and your focus should be, Jesus Christ. Has this church lost its shout, its run, its track passing and soul saved and memory verses and because God blessed us with this child? Because we have so many people into Bible-believing churches. We hear so many souls getting saved every month and Oh, when, when God blesses you with children, now we lose our focus on the Lord. Isn't not, no, I won't leave you again. I won't leave you again. If God gave you what you wanted, would you leave him? God gave you what you wanted, and answered your prayer, will you leave him again? I know this, this ain't your first time you left him after he blessed you and answered your prayer. When you look at uh, verse 31 through 32, and Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awake. And when Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. 
You know, Elisha did go down with the woman of Shunem, but Elisha did not go to resurrect the dead child. Gehazi was the one who went to the trial first. Gehazi was the one that tried to put the staff on the child's face. Gehazi was the one that was tried to resurrect the child, and God did not heal that child. You know why? God said, no, I don't want Gehazi. I want you, Elisha. Elisha, he wouldn't have... Isn't it interesting that that verse is inserted about Gehazi going in first before Elisha? Think about it. Elisha would not have to work upon the child if Gehazi's work was good enough. But Gehazi's work was not to heal the child. That's Elisha's job. Gehazi's job was to prepare the way for Elisha. Gehazi's job was to let Elisha know, hey, I can't do it. You're supposed to heal. Gehazi is the one that's supposed to lead Elisha to do the healing. If God, uh, if Elisha, excuse me, if Elisha did not have a Gehazi, there would be no one to lead him to do that. You know what Gehazi means? Valley of vision. You know what the Bible says in Isaiah about the valley of vision? The burden, the burden the word of the Lord in the valley of vision. And that passage has been famously used by preachers saying that in our Bible-believing churches, we have lacked a burden. And we lack vision. All we think about is just coming to church and doing our normal duties. No, we got to have a vision that, hey, we want souls to get saved here. We want people to know about this church. And we want to spread throughout the whole world. And then we want to do great things for God. We want souls to get saved. Do you know how many nationalities are dying and burning in hell over here? And you think giving your money to missionaries, your job is accomplished? We lack the burden. We lack the vision. Do you know how many children, not just your children, but other children out there who are messed up in drugs, broken homes, and no one is ministering to them. No one is bringing them to this church. No one, that, no one is raising them in the admonition of the Lord. Do you know how many parents we have lost? Parents who have lost godly principles to raise their children in their home. We have no burden for our next generation. We have lost our vision. You know I have a vision? I have a vision that our next generation, that they'll grow up clean. They never taste sin. They love the Lord Jesus Christ. And they get to love Jesus, do Bible-believing things, not waste their years like many of you did. Wouldn't that be your vision and dream for your next generation? Wouldn't it be your, version, uh, wouldn't it be your vision and dream that people of your nationality get saved and not just you? The people of your demographic get to say, not just you. We have lost our burden. We have lost our vision. And that's why Elisha has not been coming down and the spiritual power of God has not been moving out of this church. If we want Jesus Christ to come down with his double portion of his spirit and we want fruits, we want soul saved and we want to bring something to God and rescue rescue so many people from brokenness and wickedness out there we need a burden and a vision first so that God can finally step in and do the miracle and do the healing Good, you know why God's not moving in this church you know why God's not doing any miracles or healing because you don't have a burden or a vision if you have a burden and a vision first, then it will move God to do something. You know, I didn't just go online because I thought this was a cool idea. I had a burden and a vision because so many people were getting deceived online. Wrong doctrines was infecting all churches. And I was so angry at the scholars and the false pastors and online trolls out there that I put our content up. And who would have thought the Lord moved in, didn't he? The Lord was able to bring him fruit, didn't he? Why? Because of a burden and a vision. Now, if the pastor is the only one that has that and not you, we're in trouble. But if the pastor has it and the church shares that same burden and vision with him, do you know that we'd be a powerful, a powerful force that would be unreckoned with? You know why God's not moving in the singing like he used to? My God's not moving in the souls getting saved like he used to. 
Why God's not moving in the online ministry like he used to. Why God's not moving in the fellowship like he used to. Why blowout preparations, revival preparations, all that is not like as fiery or as full-hearted like it used to because we lost our burden and vision. You know who are the people who come to summer camp? Who are the ones who come to the blowout? Those who are hungry for it. Those who have a burden and a vision. The Bible says right here in uh, verse 32, notice 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. Elisha went into the house and healed the child. But he didn't just go up to the child and say, be healed. You know what he did? He put his body on top of his body. He shut the door behind him just like that great woman of Shunem intended. The door shut behind her. Just him alone with the child. And he gave, he put his mouth on the child's mouth so that he can breathe life into him. He put his hand on his hand to put life into him. And you know what that's a great picture of? That's a great picture of Elisha's power and spirit. He's giving a part of himself to that child. And he's becoming now one with that child. Can you imagine what used to be the child putting a gap between Elisha and the great woman of Shunem? Now... The child and Elisha has become one to become a blessing for the great woman of Shunem. You know what you're lacking? Your child lacks the spirit and the power and the life of Elisha. Why? Because Elisha wasn't your focus. God is my salvation is not your focus. I mean, he, you wanted, I mean, Lord, uh, please answer my prayer and then give me better health. Well, praise the Lord, you got health, but you haven't been using it for the Lord, haven't you, after he healed you? Come on. Lord, give us a building so that we can do more things for you. And God's like, what? Are you kidding me? I don't see you doing more things for me as soon as I gave you the building. You know what we want when God blesses us with a child? It is time that we put God still as our number one focus and not the child. And what God will do upon your life, he wants to take your child. He wants to take his blessing upon your life. And if you put him as number one, then he will combine with that blessing. He will combine with that answer prayer request. Amen. He will combine with that child that's precious in your life. And it will turn into a great, powerful thing that if you, all your blessings have the spirit and the life of God in it. Thank you, Lord. That's good. This building is just a dead building. It has no spirit and life in it if that's how you de-emphasize God and not make him number one in your life. And we can renovate this till we turn black and blue and work hard, but we'll have no spirit in life in the upcoming blowout okay. if, you, if you won't surrender yourself, if you won't surrender your child to God. And I'll guarantee you this, you thought your child was the one that you prized the most, pretty soon it'll be the least on your list. If you keep focusing on the child, the child, the child, pretty soon that thing won't be the number one in your life. The number one thing will be you. Come on. Because you only love that child because of your selfish interest, how it pleased you. But when it doesn't please you anymore, then all you can think about is yourself and that child means nothing to you. Thank you, brother. That's good. You know what will keep your appreciation for the child? If you make God number one in your life, not the child. And if you say, God, you're my all in all, then God, what he can do is put his hand on that blessing's hand, put his spirit into that blessing, and then go, and then he'll put his spirit and life into it. And when we come into this building and when we have our blood, that spirit will be so thick that you can feel it. And when that preacher comes up, your heart cannot help but be moved. And when those songs are sung, you cannot help but weep. You cannot help but shout. You cannot help but run. And you cannot help but say, oh, thank you, God. Amen. 
What happened to your brothers and sisters in Christ, to the family, that the Bible-believing family that you're looking for all this time? Now they become the least of your concerns. Now you don't take them as important anymore. You know why? Because God has not been number one in your life. And if you would have that in your life, then that fellowship with your brother and sister in Christ, like Brother Randall was talking about, the reason why there's bitterness, clamor, evil speaking is you're not walking in the Spirit. God is not number one in your life. You're not looking at them through God. If you were to do that, the love of the brethren will be more real than you. But you're like, oh, I want fellowship with Bible-believing family. And then when God gives it to you, now you start to find problems and faults. And you think that, oh, you know, this is not good. This ain't real. No, it's because you're only thinking about yourself. And you got to think about God. And what God will do is that he'll put his hand on the brothers and sisters in Christ here. He'll put his spirit in them. And if you make God number one in your life as you fellowship, during fellowship time, God's going to go. And then just a simple high from a brother and sister in Christ will mean a lot to you. Amen. That's it. And not a struggle, not a hassle. That's good. No, our fellowship has been dead. There's no spirit in life from God. God has not been number one in our life. And when you look at verse 37, then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. <laughs> she was so grateful. She bowed herself to the feet of Elisha, saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for healing my child. When she went out, she did not leave the same way she came back in. She left not with just her child. Do you understand? She left with her child who had the spirit and life of Elisha in her child. When you come down on this altar and you give God the glory and surrender your child to him, wouldn't it be great if you went out after this with that child who has the spirit and life of God in it? Or are you going to go back home with no God in it again? Come on, brother. If I were you, I'd take up that child. And remember, it's something the Lord can hide from you too. Remember that? Right. It's time that you surrender that and say, Lord, this is yours. Okay. And you need to shut the door behind you. Put that child on the bed, the altar of God and say, he's yours. And when you get out of here with that child in your hand, you're not going to treat that child the same like you did before. You're going to have the child with the spirit and power of God in it, and you're going to use that child differently, treat that child differently, much more than what you used to do. Who's your child? Your job? Your family? Your loving relationship? Your prayer request? your possession, your money, fellowship in this church, this ministry, whatever your child is, it's time to shut the door behind you on your seat, get on this altar, put the child on the bed, surrender it to the Lord, and go out with the spirit and life of God in it. Every head bow and every eye shut.